Welcome one and all to a response to a thread that originated on my buddy Marty Worm's channel, top whatever, most meaningful albums. If you could affordably get me a time machine, I would go back in time, I would kick Donald Trump's parents both in the crotch real hard, and also with that time machine, I would go back to the day um, where this was pretty much the entirety of my music collection. Um, these are uh, definitely my entry points into several different areas within metal. There's a couple of different ways in my mind that you could answer this question. Meaningful, I've got records that mean so much more to me than these because I have some connection with them because of a friend or because of just a, a good night with friends or um, a meaningful person that has passed. Um, so I, I kind of set that aside because I felt like answering the question more honestly would, would, would result in a more entertaining video. And I think that, I think the commenter was kind of looking for this kind of video. <laughs> Anyways, so also I'm totally double dipping on a lot of this stuff. I've done a few videos in the past, way in the past. So like, I don't know, I'm, I need to get more comfortable with the idea of like double dipping on a lot of stuff um, because it's actually kind of hard to find some of the videos that I've done. I did a like top 10 albums that got me into black metal, death metal, um, I also had a guest on once where we picked like the most five, I think meaningful or life changing or something records. Anyways, um, I'll try if I can link down below all that so you can check it out. Um, so this is kind of an amalgam of all that, a rehashing of uh, this topic um, and really like a snapshot in um, my lifetime between the age of 17 and 20. Um, and I'm 40 now, so I mean this is a real step back in time uh, and but it also like it's a very specific time period um, A lot of people's diff answers are going to be way different from mine because they got into metal at a different time than I did uh, And a lot of these are like the formative bands that a lot of people I think would cite in this response, but maybe not the particular albums that they would cite uh, so anyways totally random nothing top nothing ranked um, just if I, if I really went, okay, so I can really trace back. I remember the night, um, me and a guy that I worked with at Sunmart Foods, uh, were driving around. Um, so what we would do is we would refund, um, I don't know, if, if you live in another state, you might not know what this is about, but um, you get five cents in Iowa for recycling a bottle or can. Um, but when you did that at Sunmart, there were some that our, uh, our recycler wouldn't take from us. So we would go over to the competitor and uh, drop off all of those and get five cents for those bottles and cans and make it their fucking problem. So anyways, I wound up hanging out with this kid that I worked with um, under those circumstances and he was listening to something that I'd never heard before. At that time period, um, I had just begun driving. Um, I was really, really poor making $5.15 an hour um, part-time throwing bottles into a box all day long. Um, and I was listening to stuff on the radio at that time. Um, some of my favorite stuff was like Nirvana, um, Alice in Chains, a little bit of Pearl Jam, Stone Double Pilots. Kind of started to get into Rage Against the Machine a little bit. Um, a ton of stuff that just like I don't, I've never gone back to, honestly. Um, and, I, and I specifically remember um, liking that music, but thinking like, there's got to be something more. There's, this is not solving what I need out of music. And when I first heard uh, my friend, well, my friend, my coworker, who is now my friend, um, playing Fear Factory on his car stereo that night, it fucking clicked. It was angry the way I felt angry, and it, it just took so much of that out of me. And it was, it was weird to just be like hanging out with this dude that I work with and doing some weird uh, errand for work and having a life-changing experience that to this day 
is making me sit in front of my cell phone and talk to a bunch of strangers on YouTube. Um, so Fear Factory was the the gateway, the the very key um, into this world um, that I never looked back from. Um, I don't quite remember if it was D Manufacture or if it was Soul of a New Machine at that time. Um, either way, both of those albums were out around that time, uh, and he dubbed both of those albums on cassette for me. And I listened to those fucking things non-stop. Um, might as well have something to show for it. I have since revisited The Manufacturer, maybe about two years ago, uh, and I found it completely revolting, and I couldn't listen to it. And I may have even gotten rid of it. Uh, I kind of have a, a bad habit of knee-jerk reaction, just like walking out my front door and chucking CDs in the next neighbor's yard. Not true, but like sometimes a band like Fear Factory can fucking sour in my mouth so bad that I just go, get it out of my house. But Soul of a New Machine holds the fuck up really well. Um, but yeah, like this was so meaningful for me because it was the very first entry point into metal. And I remember so distinctly, so clearly, like it was yesterday, feeling like that's what's going on in my fucking head. I was seriously a, a raging fucking teenager. Luckily, I didn't wind up having kids or having an alcohol problem or anything like that. Um, I wound up really liking a lot of drugs, and I don't regret it whatsoever, but things could have really, I feel like, turned out a lot worse if I would not have found um, a genre of music that, as I say sometimes, does the anger for me. Um, you know, all kinds of music. You, you listen for this, like, corroborating kind of emotion just to kind of have some exchange with an album, with an artist, with another person, um, without having to go through a, a whole lot of ordeal. Um, and to me that's what makes music so important to people like us, who just ravenously listen and collect to this, this kind of stuff. By the way, I forgot to mention in the beginning, we are listening to Cyclone Temple, I Hate Therefore I Am. Fucking rad. Ugh. This, I wouldn't say this was like a meaningful album in any ways. Um, I've just always loved it. My good buddy introduced me to it. Um, so, around, so like, Fear Factory took a fucking hold and I, I went absolutely nuts. What else you got? Um, so quickly, my buddy also got me into Sepultura. Um, at that time, I had just gotten a copy of Korn's Life is Peachy. Um, I kind of liked it for a minute. I might have had it like two weeks. Then my buddy gave me a couple of Sepultura's Roots, and I was like, fuck this corn CD. Um, and I really, really, I listened to the shit out of that. I don't even own a copy of it anymore. Um, I haven't listened to that record in mm, 15, 20 years or so. But, and that was that was a big record for me, for sure. But um, Chaos AD, the one before that, um, my senior year in high school, this was the only tape in my car, and I listened to it all of the time. I, my car was my Chaos AD machine. I, I played it non-stop, full volume, windows down, everywhere I went for nine months out of the year, probably. I still, to this day, think this record holds up every fucking way. Um, not to say that the records that came before this aren't amazing and, in, in some regards, better, but Chaos CD was there for me when I needed it. Uh, it's so bombastic and just raging. Um, it's just got a lot of, such a catchy record. Um, Chaos AD man, it rules. I still stand by it. Um, it's just kind of dumb. And it's kind of, I guess, honestly, it's kind of like maybe a regrettable turn for Sepultura to have taken, but every band makes that turn, you know? Eventually, a band keeps evolving to a point where you're just like, not, nope, not anymore. Um, so, you know, those records were huge. Also, Carcass's heart work was huge. This had uh, come out one or two years prior. And this thing is just fucking all frosting riffs all over the place. It's so decadent and melodic and catchy and memorable. Um, it doesn't have the rage and anger like a lot of the other albums that I was listening to around that time. Um, but it just feels so artistic and it feels so well put together. And it's just, it really was um, a glimpse into how 
illustrious and well orchestrated and just thoughtful and intelligent this music could be. I still think this record is fucking amazing. Um, I think maybe if I had to pick a favorite, I'd say Necroticism, um, but this is a real special one to me. Um, this is some earache version that came out with an extra DVD and some demo versions put onto it. Um, I wound up getting rid of my original copy of it. Funny thing is, like, I was such a, a listener of the time period that I haven't even bothered to go back and buy vinyl copies of most of the stuff you're going to see here. So, like, these CD copies I'm going to be showing you tonight is literally my collection at that time. Um, and most of these I've just never really bothered to buy a vinyl copy of because just these are my copies of these special albums. Um, so anyways, another album that just floored me at the gates, Slaughter of the Soul. Um, I'm sure most people ought to know this record. Most people, I think this is maybe their entryway into at the gates. Uh, it's probably also a big entry point into metal for that time. Um, this was really a template of uh, a Swedish death metal band finding their way into the mainstream writing just completely infectious, insanely melodic and memorable songs with all the rage of fucking Slayer um, and all the fucking greats that came before. This was just such a just cornerstone timepiece of the time period. Um, I still think it's some of the best songwriting uh, metal has ever seen, but again, it's kind of one of those unfortunate turns for a band in their discography where they were progressing beyond a point where their credibility and like the real sweet spot was um, but that doesn't diminish whatsoever how important this record was for me um, when I was first getting into it. Um, it you know everything that I said about Carcass's heart work being super melodic and it's illustrious and just well orchestrated and intelligently written but not sacrificing any rage whatsoever and anger um, in fact, I think this might be F. the Gates' most angry, just seething with just blistering uh, kind of 22-year-old pain. Um, it sounds a lot like this. I would say now that my favorite F. the Gates record is probably The Red in the Sky is Ours for completely different reasons. Um, but I'll always hold all of these records uh, a special place in my heart. Um, so this is, I guess, kind of going chronologically, if you will. Um, in my mind. Um, another really, really special record around that time was Dusk and Her Embrace by none other than Cradle of Filth. Um, this, yeah, it, like, I didn't know that anybody, that anything was going on like this. I thought that, like, the pinnacle of heavy music was what I was hearing on the radio. How would, like, how would there be a kind of music that was so good that most people hadn't heard? That didn't make sense to me. And, like, Honestly, sometimes it still doesn't to me. Um, um, so, like, that just... Once you plunk your head through the manhole cover into the underground, you're just there for life. Um, but anyways, this album came out in 96, and it just... There's nothing else like this. If you're listening to straight-up shit that you heard on the radio, um, <clears throat> there was a time period where my, in my first couple years in high school where I was buying my own music, but man, I was so dirt fucking poor. Um, I would ride my bike six miles to the mall to pick up a copy of Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style on cassette for $12. That was it. I had one album for the next two years. <laughs> so I really became a fucking shitbag with blowing my money on metal once I discovered bands like Cradle of Filth. It's so theatrical. The songwriting is just has this ebb and flow, and there's just so it's just so vibrant, and it has so much of a story to tell with its just cataclysmic wax and wane of emotion going on. It's super poetic. It's super violent and vampiric. It reminded me of movies like Bram Stoker's Dracula at the time. Um, I went on up going ahead and seeing these guys live at Milwaukee Metal Fest '97. Um, can't believe 17 year old me went up and did that but uh yeah this album just blew my goddamn mind to this day i could play air drums to the entire record i know the album front to fucking back um as most of these records i honestly do um another one you know a lot of things that i said about dusk and her embrace could also be said about anthems of the walking at dusk this is the absolute pinnacle 
chef's kiss of orchestral Norwegian black metal, top notch. It's super catchy, memorable. I would maybe be open to the idea of a remaster of this record. I listened to it on headphones not too long ago, and I it was like a whole different record to me, and I kind of felt like it's worth revisiting, um, but this is where it's at, man. Um, yeah. Also went and saw them at Milwaukee Metal Fest 98. Blew my goddamn mind. Um, so another, like some death metal stuff that was also really coming out around that time. Domination by Morbid Angel was huge to me around that time. Um, I don't know what it was. It was just like, I think Sandoval's drumming was something that I really, really latched onto. Um, and David Vincent kind of had this like 80s hair metal kind of frontman style to him. Not that he was necessarily singing that way, but like the way that he enunciates, um, especially from Domination and going forward into the fucking Ultimus era, um, there was something a little relatable to that for me. And uh, there's, there's some shit songs on here. There's some fun songs on here. There's some absolute blasting fucking barbaric moments on it. Uh, but it's, it's kind of all over the place, honestly. There's some really good parts. Um, and there's some total crap on it. But it's fun. Um, and really dumb, formative record for me. Um, for a while there, I was like going between saying that Pete Sandoval and Nick Barker were my favorite drummers because of Cradle of Filth and Morbid Angel. Another album along those lines that blew my fucking mind around that time, Pierce From Within by Suffocation. Man, this just had all the fucking, like this to me sounded scary. It was like, okay, you, you have this anger problem that is being solved by this music, but this kind of felt like it was going a little bit too far. This seriously felt like grabbing me by the neck and fucking holding me underwater until I'm just about near death and pulling me back up, back and forth. It's fucking violent, vicious, unrelenting, catchy somehow, uh, and just so fucking perfect. Um, this probably is my my favorite Suffocation record for those reasons. It was just the first Suffocation album I heard, and it's just so good. Full of great riffs. Um, I kind of wish Mike Smith had been the drummer on that album, but can't always win them all. Um, <laughs> this is my favorite album of all time. Thousand in the North by Immortal. I'm sure this is, you know, nothing strange to any of you. Um, but what a unique and weird, I, there's just nothing like this, honestly. There's Norwegian black metal, there's Immortal albums, there's Pure Holocaust, there's Diabolical Full Moon Mysticism, but there's nothing like Battles in the North. It's fucking weird, it's snowy and frosty and vicious and like, it's just, it's seriously, it's like getting lost and ensorcelled in a fucking tornado of snow. Um, it's so charismatic and it just exudes so much personality that these guys were dealing with around that time. Um, I just, I think this is just one of the most special, important, and artistic albums that I've ever heard. It's like, I feel like it gets categorized kind of lazily with a lot of the ways that you could, but it's worth stating that it is really fucking weird. Guitar wise, it's super, super just bonkers. Um, I don't know. I would challenge a guitar player to sit down and actually figure out how to play these riffs, and then I think you would kind of see, like, wow, this guy really was just writing himself into a fucking corner and working his way back out of it. Um, I don't know how to play guitar, but I'm just so impressed by <clears throat> the inventiveness of these young guys around this time. I think Battles of the North cannot be oversold. Um, so another thing that was, like, a mounting frustration for me around that time period was Christianity. I was raised um, Christian Baptist, um, and you know I was just really bounced around to lots of different churches, um, and I disagreed with all of them. And I remember distinctly at the age of nine, um, there was a sermon that went on at my church, and the guy, the pastor, said, "The biggest sin is doubting your faith," and I just couldn't stop thinking about, well, that's fucking perfect, isn't it? Um, and I really just, like, I fought my way out of it. Um, and it was kind of a secret that I didn't really share with my dad. 
and my mom really had a hard time dealing with it forever and ever and ever. So it was Marduk's Heaven Shall Burn that spoke to my little atheist heart. Um, and honestly, this has so much to do with why I took to the genre so much because it's so anti-Christian. There's, there's just something so poetic about being an atheist and just wielding this fucking angry, satanic music because atheism doesn't necessarily oppose Christianity head on. It just doesn't feel right. It feels like, atheism feels like abstaining from the conversation and Marduk feels like taking them fucking head on. Um, so that just, it melds that anger that you have for Christianity at that time uh, with how you're feeling about everything else around that time period. Um, and this album just fucking did it for me. It's vampiric, it's fucking creepy and eerie, but also melodic and catchy and vicious. A lot of people say that Panzer Division Marduk uh, is their best, but for me, it's either this or Opus Nocturne. Heaven shall burn. I gotta put that on there tomorrow. So, um, another one, like, we're still on day one here. Um, age 17, I had taken all my Wu-Tang albums to the used store. Um, if I didn't talk about that, I, did, I talked, touched on it for a minute too, but um, I think it was like the last half of my sophomore year and maybe the first half of my senior year, I was pretty into East Coast hip hop, stuff like Nas, uh, Wu-Tang before they put out their shitty Forever album, End of the 36 Chambers, Rascast, shit like that. I was really into that kind of stuff, Mop Deep, um, but quickly when I discovered metal, it was just like, nope, get out in the yard <laughs> with all that shit. I got rid of all that shit. Um, so again, day one shit, this was a fucking mind blower, Storm of the Lights Bane by Dissection. It's a perfect record in every way. Um, say what you will about John Notefight, you know, I, he's a contentious topic to talk about, but what these guys did is an absolute feat that I am, I will always be in complete awe of. Um, this is some of the most important music I think that has ever been written. Storm of the Lights Band, you all know it, and you know that everything they did after it fucking sucks. Um, so two more mind blowers from around that very specific time period. Um, so I had a friend, so like this friend of mine who was getting into metal, um, had also had this friend named Nick and he had been a foreign exchange student over in Germany for the last, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, and it was weird because he and I got to be like best fucking friends, but he never talked about this Nick guy until he came back. And Nick had been over in Germany and he had been discovering metal. Uh, like when he was over here in the States, he was into like Gorefest and Carcass and all that kind of shit. He went over to Europe and discovered like black metal, serious fucking black metal. Um, and he brought some records back. Um, so he came over one day to visit my friend Kelly and he had a stack of those, these records. Um, and I don't remember what all of them were. I really wish I could like go back in time and look at what he had brought back. Um, but he had some seriously underground stuff. I think he brought like Iltyarn, Mach. Um, he was really into like the more Viking-ish kind of stuff. And so this was, this was 96. So one thing he did bring back um, in that pile. And so what I did was <laughs> they just got to talking and I kind of felt like I was a little left out. And these guys had all the catching up they needed to do. Um, so I just took one album. I didn't know anything about this album. And I snuck downstairs and I popped it in. I was so curious about what this guy had brought back from um, Europe. And I picked this album because the album cover doesn't look like a metal album cover. Burzum's Philosophy. So I went downstairs and I put on Burzum in the CD player by myself. And I had absolutely no context for this whatsoever. I didn't know what I was listening to. And honestly, I had never heard like atmospheric black metal. I had never heard black metal that was really anything like this. Um, and at this time period, all the other black metal that sounded like this wasn't in Iowa for that fucking matter. Um, so I wound up getting stoned the first time I listened to Philosophem and it blew my goddamn mind. I was absolutely floored by it. I had never heard anything like it. 
and I remember just thinking, I am so lucky, I'm so happy that I have found metal. <laughs> so, I mean, talk about a formative record, Philosophem. Turned out to be a shitbag of a human being, but that doesn't mean I didn't have my goddamn gourd split open and spilled onto the floor by Philosophem. Um, just the stirring atmosphere, the coziness of it, just the wall of guitars, the repetitiveness of it, the way it's so like loosely put together and kind of poorly performed. Um, there's just a lot of nuance there to really sink your teeth into. Um, it's got a lot of personality as a record and, and Philosophem, there's just no way around it. It's, it's a cornerstone album. It's one of those just very important records. Um, so. Another one around that time that my buddy, for some reason, was way into. Um, I feel like a lot of people kind of overlooked this. It didn't really get its due, um, but it was super important because I just, I took to it. I was glued to Wraths of Time by Swordmaster so much. I would just alternate between Dissection, Swordmaster, um, also the first Algeon EP, Vox Clementis, and uh, Oi My Algae. This is Swedish black metal. Uh, it's super great. It's got kind of a little bit of a thrashy edge to it, a little bit of a kind of 80s style to it. But um, after this EP, they went completely differently. So if, if you have an idea of what Swordmaster is, being kind of like a thrashy metal band or something like a retro black thrash kind of thing, listen to Raz of Time. It's way different. It's super good. The songwriting is just awesome. I think it's fucking great. And uh, so there was also a record store around this time period, but um, I didn't have a car for a lot of those years, so I wasn't able to get into town to uh, pick up albums all that much. But uh, this album was definitely another turning point for me. Um, it was like, you know, my buddies and I would sit around and we would just be like, you know, I'm thinking about getting Pure Holocaust. I've been hearing, reading Metal Maniacs, and, you know, I read good reviews about it. I see some interviews here and there, and, you know, I think it sounds like a good album to pick up. It just seems so insane to me to think that we were just sitting there in the midst of having all these amazing black and death metal albums out there that we hadn't heard. Just, just thinking about relishing that moment where you couldn't make a misstep. You couldn't go to the record store in the metal section and pick up really anything that was a piece of shit like you can now. So I just remember hearing a lot about Dark Throne and that the place to start with them was Transylvanian Hunger. And I went to that record store and I bought a lot of things, a lot of this stuff. Um, and I remember just kind of thinking like, not yet. I'm not ready for this yet. You're not ready for Transylvanian Hunger. This is advanced listening. Um, and I still feel that way. Like you've really got to have a lot of um, foregone context in order to fully appreciate Transylvanian Hunger um, because it references things in a different way uh, than a lot of other bands do and it has like what is so special about it to me is how it it's so bleak and it's so vividly monochromatic it seriously it just shuts the lights out and it is the absolute epitome of fucking darkness and for the, for a 18 year old kid to just have his mind wrapped around that idea um, is just it's insane. Transylvania Hunger is still by far my favorite Dark Throne record. It's perfect in every fucking way. Um, so it it came finally a period where I said, okay, I think I'm ready for Transylvania Hunger. And luckily enough, I did get it. It took it took the way it was supposed to. I think right away. Um, I feel bad for somebody who might put on Transylvanian Hunger and not get it. Um, I, I feel like it's it's really, there's a lot more going on than just riffs and drums and vocals. Um, it's a really special album to me. Um, and I remember just thinking like, wow, this music can be so many things um, based on what I've heard at this point, like two or three years, just having your mind fucking repeatedly blown couple times a week um so then um about a couple years older i moved out of the house had a couple jobs at one point i was working like 70 hours a week while i was in college um and i wound up dropping out of college but um i didn't know how to figure out how to live on my own but i would go to these church thrift stores um they would do it like once a month or so and uh i wound up going in there one time and they have this stack of cassettes and usually at that time I was like, cassettes are only worth the shit if I can play them in my car. Um, 
And I wound up finding like a bunch of hair metal kind of stuff. There was shit like Y&T and Kicks and Helix and shit in there. Like I was like, I don't know what these are, but they're 20 cents a piece. I'm just gonna buy the whole fucking stack of them and see what's in here. There were, so like, a lot of that stuff was complete and utter hair metal, but two of those albums wound up being super important and some of my favorite albums. Um, Keeper of the Seven Keys Part Two. I have since given away the cassette, but here's a CD copy, you'll live. Um, what a special, important, just amazing record. So like, this was my first foray out of the very specific time period when I was getting into metal. Most of these albums that I've already talked about so far are came out between like 93 and 98, maybe even 96, somewhere around there, just like a very small window. So like, once I got to be the age of 21, 22, it was time to look back and learn about everything that had happened before that, uh, which I'm still doing. That's, that's a fucking journey that will never end. Um, but this is one that blew my goddamn mind. The songwriting on here is amazing. Um, I know Marty showed Walls of Jericho in his video, and that was an album that I picked up after I got this, and I hated it. I've never looked back. I don't think I've even listened to it since I got rid of it. Uh, I'm sure now it's an amazing record, and I probably love it, but um, it just didn't work right away. It didn't work like Keeper of the Seven Keys Part 2 did. <laughs> I did wind up picking up Part 2, and I love it. I always, I can never decide if I like Part 1 or Part 2 more. Um, I... Sometimes I, I guess I would say I like this one more, but it's more special to me than one. One is a better record just to listen to at any time, but there's so many more strings attached to part two for me. Um, I just remember driving around in my car listening to this album non-fucking-stop. It's so catchy and fun. Um, and it was the first maybe metal record, I think, where it wasn't angry like all the other stuff that I was listening to. Um, so another album that I got in that stack of albums was Time Does Not Heal by Dark Angel. This copy is signed by Gene Hovland. Um, just a fucking riff salad, man. This uh, Dark Angel has done a lot of great at records, but this thing, dude, dude. There are some, like, this might be the 80s necroticism. Um, chew on that for a minute. I think Necroticism is just a fucking absolute riff buffet. This thing is as well. So good. Um, we won't even talk about Ron Reinhardt's singing. Whatever. Um, I know every word. I sing along to every word and then I go, fucking Ron Reinhardt. Anyways, those are some very formative and memorable albums to me. It was fun to go back and kind of uh, rehash those old times with you. I hope you uh, enjoyed it. There's a lot more that I could pull out that I just didn't feel like rambling on for 45 minutes or something. I can't do 20. Um, but these records right here are so very special to me. Uh, they're just ingrained in my DNA at this point. Um, so we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. To all the other people who have done videos in this thread, I'll try at this point and put them down below so that you can check them out and support them. Uh, Marty Worm, Future Ruins, Dark Path have done them. Um, I believe th I, that's all I have on top of my head that I can remember right now. Anyways, also check out Cyclone Temple. I hate for there I am. So good. See you next time.